The RDS-220, more commonly known as the Sar Bomba, is the largest nuclear weapon ever tested. We are Ryan Zhou, Miran Andrievsky, Darren Lee, Paul Sobel, and Cameron Zhang. We will be bringing you a breakdown of the science behind the bomb and its recorded and estimated effects. It was developed by the Soviet Union to have an explosive yield equivalent to 100 megatons of TNT, but it was lowered to 50 megatons to give the pilot dropping it a chance of survival. This video will cover the principles and assembly of the bomb, the immediate effects at detonation, important statistics about the bomb, the short-term thermal and radiation effects of the bomb, and the long-term effects of the bomb. Let's get to it. <clears throat> Tsar Bomba was a three-stage hydrogen bomb. The first stage was a fission-type implosion bomb. I'm going to break down both of those words. So, an implosion bomb changes a small subcritical mass of plutonium into a critical mass. The neutron initiator is composed of beryllium and polonium-210. The two chemicals are crushed and mixed, emitting neutrons which cause a fission chain reaction. Then, a shell of plutonium, which is surrounded by a casing of uranium-238, or 238, reflects the neutrons back into the pit to sustain the chain reaction. Boron plastic protects the core from any spare neutrons. A thick aluminum pusher compresses everything with an explosive shockwave. The explosive composition B surrounds that shockwave. A cone-shaped barotel explosive lens are, are placed right outside and are once again surrounded by more composition B. Duralumin with brass chimney sleeves retains the detonators, and the firing of the detonator sets off a spherical shock wave. The spray of neutrons is released from that shock wave, and the energy released by the chain reaction that's happening expands into an atomic fireball. A fission reaction occurs when the neutron strikes the nucleus of another isotope. The neutron splits the nucleus into pieces and releases energy. More neutrons are produced by the splitting of the atom, and then they go on to strike nearby nuclei and produce more fission. This chain reaction keeps going, making the reaction automatic. This reaction in the bomb is boosted by hydrogen gas, which kept the pit of the bomb from imploding and pushed the atoms closer together. The second stage was two relatively small nuclear charges. The primary explosion compressed the fuel from the outside, which caused the charges to become supercritical in fission, which then heated the hydrogen gas on the outside. This heat started fusion reactions, which are known as thermonuclear reactions, which is why this is a thermonuclear, thermonuclear or hydrogen bomb. The energy and heat fused the hydrogen isotopes together which created a fireball so hot that its temperature was comparable to that of the center of the sun. The second stage helped trigger the radiation implosion of the third stage by starting a thermonuclear reaction within the main thermonuclear module located between them. The reaction caused huge numbers of high-energy fast neutrons to form within the module. Originally, it was planned for the bomb's outer layer to be made of surrounding uranium-238 to multiply the reaction from 50 megatons to 100 megatons. However, due to concerns that the plane dropping it would not be able to survive from that amount, lead was used instead. Lead is nuclear passive, so it absorbed the freed neutrons from the fusion reaction of the second stage, and unlike uranium-238, it would not cause more fission. It reduced the amount of radioactive fission products, and it reduced the possible radioactive contamination as well. The Sar Bomba, with an explosive yield equivalent to 50 megatons of TNT, is the largest tested nuclear weapon in human history. It was detonated at 11.32 Moscow local time on the 30th of October 1961 in an airburst test 4 kilometers above the ground at Novaya Zemlya. A 60-kilometer tall mushroom cloud was produced, and light from this test was seen more than 1,000 kilometers away. An uninhabited village named Severny, located 55 kilometers from the bomb's epicenter, was completely leveled by the explosion. In addition, buildings within 160 kilometers were reported as damaged, and it was calculated that anyone within 100 kilometers of the detonation would have received third-degree burns. It is estimated that this would have left behind a 340-meter-deep crater with an inside radius of 0.71 kilometers and a lip radius of 1.42 kilometers. NukeMap estimates that this nuclear fireball would have a radius of 3.62 kilometers and that heavy damage would have been caused within 8.03 kilometers had the sar bomber been dropped on an urban setting that would have been catastrophic
The largest tested bomb as of 2023 was the massive RDS-220 hydrogen bomb, nicknamed Tsar Bomba, which roughly translates into King Bomb from Russian. At 50 megatons of trinitrotulene, or TNT, the blast was around 1,600 times more powerful than the Little Boy Bomb, seen here, that was dropped on Hiroshima. Reading about how devastating and extremely powerful the Little Boy nuclear bomb was from John Hersey's Hiroshima, actually knowing the statistics behind the Tsar Bomba blast really puts into perspective how catastrophic it would be if, God forbid, it was to be dropped anywhere containing life or people. There are many additional factors that are contributed if a bomb this size and this strength were to be detonated. People need to know how the effects are more than just the immediate ones. To begin with, the science and statistics behind how disastrous the Tsar Bomba would be are quite mind-boggling, and it takes a while for people to get it wrapped around their head as it is so surreal. People might not even be might not even joke about it, as it is so powerful, and just a couple hundred would wipe out humanity. Before learning about all this, I too joked about nuclear weapons, but now with the Russia-Ukraine war looming above our heads and Putin threatening to use nuclear weapons, it just naturally seems more likely, and it is important to know how insane these weapons can be. So, if the Tsar Bomba that was tested on Nova Zemlya Island in the Arctic by Russia were to be dropped directly on downtown Philadelphia, it would completely wipe out, vaporize this part of the city in the red, and everyone there would experience a very fast death, and let's say they were the lucky ones, and it was without pain, just very fast. And about 20 kilometers away from the center, most of the residential buildings were to collapse, fatalities would be widespread, and people would die slow deaths, and they would be in a lot of pain. They would suffer bad burns, etc. So, debris would be flying everywhere, injuring people. To add on, about 55 kilometers from the center in all directions, there would be light damage to buildings. But most glass would break that could potentially pierce people, cause more damage and injuries. So, to put this into perspective, the radius at full length would be from the city of Newark, where the University of Delaware is located, and all the way to Princeton, New Jersey, where the prestigious Princeton University is located. Buildings destroyed, lives lost, and families ruined, all from one 20-foot long bomb. I would also add that everybody outside of the gray, in the gray, everybody from the gray to the outside, to the yellow, would have thir bad third degree burns, which would cause, which would be very detrimental. Another major statistic would be the radioactive fallout. There are the radioactive particles that fall on the ground as a result of the blast and exposure that would be devastating. To also put this in perspective, the fallout would range from Philadelphia and travel northeast all the way to about Stamford, Connecticut, and all the cities that happen to be in between, especially New York City. To sum all this up, if the bomb were to be dropped right on downtown Philadelphia, there would be about 2.3 million fatalities and 1.59 million injuries. Most of this is just ours. It's terrible how people do not know how complex this gets. As many people watching this video live in or around Monterey, I would like to explain the statistics if the bomb were to be dropped onto Monterey. Here it is. Alright. So, if the tar bomber were to be dropped directly above Monterey, Carmel by the sea to the Pacific Grove acres would be completely wiped out. And everyone there would die immediately. Cities 20 kilometers away from the center of the blast. Such as uh, Carmel Valley, East Garrison, and Salinas would basically be fully destroyed. Third degree burns would spread all the way to 60 kilometers from the center in any direction. 
People in Soledad and Santa Cruz would all get burnt. Third degree burns are really serious. They could result in amputation or disablement. The radioactive fallout here goes west out into the Pacific, which would be detrimental to the sea life and would result in uh, maybe mutations or stuff that we don't even know what will happen. But these are the statistics behind the Todd Bomba, and I hope this put it into perspective for everyone. Thank you. Radioactive fallout or nuclear fallout is a radioactive particles that fall to Earth after a nuclear explosion, including weapon debris, fission products, and so forth. Um, over here, we have a typical radioactive particle pictured. Severity of nuclear fallout depends significantly on various factors. This includes the amount of radioactive material released, the exposure distance from explosion, etc. Immediate effects of exposure include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, extreme skin burns, and hair loss, happening within, happening within the span of um, seconds to days. These symptoms are known as ARS, or acute radiation syndrome, which can oftentimes lead to cancer. Radioactive fallout also affects the environment, primarily through the con contamination of soil and water, which impacts wildlife, agriculture, as well as basic necessities. Um, animals can also experience ARS. If the bomb's original design was pursued with its 100 megaton yield, the devastation would have been immeasurable to both the environment and people. Thankfully, the bomb's denotation was at a high altitude. The fireball was therefore repelled from the surface by the shock wave's force, thus not making contact with the Earth and reducing radioactive fallout significantly. Let's talk about the long-term effects after the explosion. Nuclear fallout is one of the most dangerous things to the surrounding areas. Where the fallout lands is determined by the direction and speed of the wind. The nuclear fallout is able to stay in the atmosphere for years until it eventually lands or precipitates to the ground. Where this fallout lands could be in a whole different region and may have other horrible effects onto the organisms that live there. Now let's move on to the various side effects due to nuclear fallout and nuclear radiation. One of the most common side effects is cancer. This happens due to the rapid destruction of DNA from radiation. The destruction of DNA isn't cancer itself because cells have means of repairing the DNA or destroying themselves to stop the spread of cancer. However, the chance of cancer becoming successful is greater when more cells than normal have destroyed DNA. More examples of these side effects include an increase in cataract rate. Cataracts are when cloudiness forms on the eye lens. This can cause blindness in some severe cases. Radiation can also damage hair follicles, which can cause severe hair loss. Blood disorders like anemia and a lower count of blood cells and white blood cells are also prevalent in those who suffer from radiation. Excluding leukemia, lymphoma, and other blood cancers, blood disorders have been known to last for about five to 10 years.